So today I'm going to talk about moments of class group distributions. So we were interested, um, last time we were talking about averages uh, of functions of the p celo subgroup of um, class groups of, say, for example, imaginary quadratic fields. And we also talked about the real quadratic case, so that would just be the same thing here. Um, so we're taking imaginary quadratic fields and we're saying, you know, over however many there are, if we average some function of the CELO P subgroups of their class group, um, what does that look like at an odd prime P? And I'm going to write this uh, with this sort of curly E like expected value or average of this function of the class groups of P to the infinity. And the reason I made the curly E and not just the normal blackboard bold E for um, expected value is because this is a little funky because of this limit. It's not actually an expected value over some distribution. It's only the limit of expected values over these distributions. And of course, for this to make sense, you have to know uh, that I'm take what k's I'm taking and how I'm ordering them. Um, but in any case, so this would be this sort of empirical average over um, over over class groups distributions. And so far. Last time we were talking a lot about what proportion of the time would you get a certain CELO P subgroup of your class group. So that would be uh, taking the average of a characteristic function of a finite abelian P group, the function that was one when your, C you know, when your group is that group and zero otherwise. Um, and if we simply had a distribution a measure on finite abelian p groups, then knowing the averages of the, the characteristic functions would determine the averages of, of other functions. But because there is this limit here, there is some, are some funky uh, analytic issues. And even in fact, if we knew the averages of the characteristics functions, it, would not, it doesn't determine the averages of other functions because of this limit. And there are some exercises coming up with sort of counterexamples uh, 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 to this sort of thing in the, in, in the notes. Uh, so that's like one, you know, you might think, well, do you really need to average other functions besides just the characteristic functions? Once you know what proportion of time you get each group, then you should know the, the, um, anything you want. But that's not quite true because of, because of this limit. Um, and so we're going to talk today about another very important class of functions to average over uh, CELO P subgroups of class groups. And these are, so for a fixed group B, the function asks how many surjective group homomorphisms do you have uh, to B? So these are surjective homomorphisms. And the, func the function F is... Uh, a you know uh, integer value function that just counts those those surjections. Okay, and these averages are important enough that we are going to call uh, such an average the B moment of the distribution of groups. So um, you can talk about that for a you know a literal um, probability measure on the space of finite abelian p groups or also in this class group case where we uh, take a limit of, of distributions, uh, we'll still talk about its, its b moment. And this, um, these moments are in analogy to the classical moments of distributions of real numbers or of random variables valued in the reals. And in that case, the, the moments are indexed by natural numbers k, and the kth moment is the average of x to the k, where x is from the distribution, or the expected value of x to the k if x is a random real um, number. And so these, in, in the probability theory of real numbers, um, these moments play a very important role and um, there are two, two big reasons uh, for that. Uh, one is that they're often more accessible 
uh, in computation, essentially because of the linearity of expectation um, or of, of averaging. Uh, often one can, can get a hold of moments of distributions. And secondly, because it turns out that if you know the moments of a distribution of real numbers, uh, and those moments don't go too fast, they actually uniquely determine the distribution uh, that, that gave those averages. And so there's a little bit more about, about that, uh, that in the notes. And in this case, now we're not talking about distributions of numbers, but distributions of finite abelian p groups. And these averages of the number of subjective homomorphisms to a fixed group play a similar role. So here uh, is an example a theorem. So I said this in the language of, of random uh, groups. So let's say x and oh, uh oh, uh, undo that erase. Let x and y be random finite abelian groups. So by that I mean random variables valued in um, in in the set of groups, not like in elements of a group, but in the, in the set of groups. So if for every finite abelian group B, we have that the expected, so this is the average, the expected value number of surjective group homomorphisms from X to B uh, is the same as from Y to B. And if you're not as um, familiar with the language of, uh, of random variables and you were just thinking about a distribution of groups, this average would be, you know, the integral of x, uh, you know, it would still just be this average where x comes from, from your distribution. So if you were thinking about a measure of groups, this would be what this average is. I've just said it in the probabilistic uh, language. All right, so if these averages are the same for every b and those averages don't grow too fast. So say not more than a constant times the size of the uh, second wedge power of b. So that just is the normal um, uh, wedge product as z modules. If that's the case, if x and y have the same moments and those moments don't go too quickly, then for every finite abelian group, uh, the probability that x uh, is a is the same as probably as y is a. So x and y have the same distribution. So this shows that these averages have this, this critical property of moments um, of distributions on the real numbers, which is in fact, they sort of contain all the information of the distribution. Uh, at first, it might just be like, well, they obviously have some information, their averages over it, but you might, you know, you might not at first guess that they in fact have all of the all of the information um, of the distribution. Now, as I said before, we have this kind of uh, limit as x goes to infinity, um, uh, and so we're interested in limits of random uh, variables valued in groups or distributions, and so we need um, to maybe be, we'd like to be able to recover a limiting distribution from limiting moments. And in fact, that's one of the, the reasons that we uh, will, for simplicity, stick to uh, the CELO P subgroups. So an analog, I should say, of this theorem for finite abelian groups is not true if you sort of introduce the additional layer of limits as we're about to, and there's some exercises in the notes uh, uh, around, around that. Um, but uh, if you restrict to abelian p groups, so we have p a prime, and let's say we have one random abelian p group, and then we have a sequence of, of random abelian p groups, x1, x2. Now, this says if for every abelian p group b, the limit of the, m the limiting moments in my sequence are equal to the moment of some fixed y, and they don't grow too fast, then for, for every finite abelian p group, the limiting sort of distribution, the limiting probability that you get some group A is the same um, as, as the probability that y had A. So this is, is like the last theorem, but it lets you work through a limit, which is important in this context because we, th when we're look, talking about these distributions of class groups of 
in number fields, there are always limits of distributions and not a, you know, a, an honest probability measure on the, on the space of groups. So, um, all right, so, all right. So the moral of that is just that um, uh, the, the averages of these, uh, these number of subjective homomorphisms to B for every B, actually, they actually determine um, the averages of the characteristic, characteristic functions. All right? So that was sort of the second property that I said that moments from uh, the probability theory of random real numbers had that was useful uh, was that they actually determine the distribution. And then the first, <laughs> the first thing I said was that they're useful because they're, they're often accessible. They're more accessible. Um, and it turns out that that is, uh, that, that is true here as well. And one of the main reasons is that the moments are actually very closely related to field counting. So the question that we were talking about uh, in the first lecture. All right, so I want to explain the, the relationship of these moments to field counting. So we'll start with a number field, K, um, and uh, we let H be the Hilbert class field of K, which we were calling before also K on ab, the maximal unramified abelian extension of K. And the reason we're talking about that is because that um, is a particular field that we know its Galois group over K is the class group of K. So, oh, I wrote K. I wrote that it was, the, I'm going to do the quadratic case here. I, should, I will change this to, this should be degree two. We'll take a quadratic number field. Okay, so we're going to take a quadratic number field, and I just know that hanging around somewhere, it's got its Hilbert class field, whose Galois group is the class group of K. And now, what these moments, they cared about surjections from, say, the class group of K to B. All right, well, what, what get, you know, once we have this, uh, this particular field whose um, Galois group is the class group of K, Via Galois theory, such a surjection exactly produces for us. So phi exactly gives us some field here L, um, where L is inside the Hilbert class field, uh, and L over K is a B extension, right? So this this via Galois theory, I mean, we you had to use class, I mean, we sort of used class field theory to produce this, this extension here, but after that, the, this surjection just via Galois theory gives us some field L, all right? Um, and related to a, a, a computation we talked about in the case of genus theory, class field theory, uh, it will tell us that L over Q is actually Galois. I mean, uh, that doesn't have to be the case when you say take a quadratic extension. And so L over K uh, is a is a Galois B extension. Um, and but not every uh, not every B extension of K will be Galois over Q. But class field theory, because it's coming uh, from this from this H over K, does tell us that L over Q is Galois and that the Galois group is a particular group. It is the uh, semi-direct product of B with the Z mod 2Z, where the non-trivial element of Z mod 2Z acts on B by multiplication by minus 1. So that's this minus 1 down here um, telling you how the Z mod 2Z acts. So what happened, uh, we went from uh, one of these surjections and we got, we got out of it a field, a field that was Gawa over Q with a particular Gawa group. And conversely, if I have an L over Q that's Galois, where the Galois group, I'll sort of make the Galois group uh, diagram over here, is the semi-direct product of B and Z mod 2Z, you know, because of, you know, B the, 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 the subgroups of this group, you know, inside of here, 
um, I can take a uh, you know an index index to to subgroup B, and that will give me some um, that will give me some quadratic field. So since this is an index to subgroup, I get a quadratic field, and since this is B uh, by you know Galois theory, so this is this is just um, you know L fixed by B, and then this is a B extension. So this, this was starting, all right, it, it's like the same, you know, like why is she drawing the same picture? The point was this picture just started with a Gawa L over Q um, uh, isomorphic to, to B semi-direct product Z mod 2Z extension, and then it produced a quadratic extension and a B extension on top of that. Um, uh, and now we had one other thing that our... Our L's that, that, that came up here, okay, so the, the, this is the maximal unramified abelian extension. So B is, of course, an abelian group here from to have a surjection from the class group to it. So uh, the abelian part is taken care of, but we also know that this, um, that this L over K that we get here will be an unramified extension because it's sitting inside of the Hilbert class field there. Um, and so we can just see from um, the... Gala theory and the theory of the inertia group that L over K is unramified exactly if all the inertia in the Gala group of L over Q intersects trivially with B. All right, because we want the B extension sitting there. We want the B extension to be unramified, so there should be no inertia, uh, no non trivial inertia subgroups there. Okay, so then that tells us that. Uh, the average of the number of surjections from class group of K to B is actually the number, these surjections correspond to these L's, so it's the number of L over Q um, the G extensions for this group G such that dot, 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 and the dot, dot, dot here um, uh, is b basically, just, uh, basically just this condition here um, because we wanted if we want the L over K to be unramified, we need to put in this condition so that L over K is unramified. Now, also, if your average meant to be over imaginary quadratic fields, the dot, dot, dot would also want to include uh, the uh, condition on the decomposition group at infinity so that you got the quadratic field was imaginary. Um, but so... That, you know, that's, that's the numerator, that this average number of surjections, and then the denominator is just the average number, uh, or sorry, just the, the, you know, the number of, of quadratic fields. And all of this is sort of up to discriminant x, and limit x goes to infinity. But basically, this turns the numerator and the denominator of this average both into field counting questions. Now, we already knew that the denominator was a field counting question. And so the numerator is also a field counting question with a slight twist that we're going to maybe impose these conditions on inertia groups and, um, and decomposition groups. Now, we haven't discussed that um, very much, except that we did, we, you know, we have already, we split our quadratic fields into imaginary quadratic fields and real quadratic fields, so that's imposing some condition at infinity. Um, but a natural follow-up to, uh, to these counting questions for counting G extensions are to also count G extensions with various local conditions, like, oh, the inertia should be here, or decomposition group should be here. Um, and I've given some references in the notes to, to much more discussion about the variance of the counting questions where you're counting with local conditions. Uh, but, yeah, so in any case, this turns the question of finding the B moment into just two, count, two field counting questions, um, one in the numerator with some, some additional conditions on, on inertia groups, and then one traditional one as we already had in the denominator. And uh, so this is not only a nice relationship between the class group questions and uh, the field counting questions, but also the actual only average <laughs> that we know, um, I keep forgetting to put my infinities in here, the only average that we, that we know, I mean, I suppose you could average like the identity, like the all ones function, but the only non-trivial average that we know on CeeLo P subgroups for odd P of class groups of quadratic fields 
precisely uses uh, this, this relationship. So um, the, only <laughs> and, uh, the only thing we've been, been able to access at all <laughs> uh, via proof uh, in this setting uh, comes, comes via this relationship between the moments and, and field counting. And so what is that? So um, that's the theorem of Davenport and Heilbronn uh, that says, in this case, this case that we were considering um, today uh, was that over k imaginary quadratic, which says that this average, remember this is like the limit as x goes to infinity of the average, the average number of surjective um, group homomorphisms from the class group of k to z mod 3z is 1 over k imaginary quadratic fields. They also do it for k real quadratic fields, and then you get one third. But we're, we'll just um, uh, focus in the, in the lecture uh, on the imaginary quadratic case. And again, in the notes, the, all the, also all the details about the real quadratic case. And so perhaps you recall I talked about um, uh, Davenport uh, Heilbronn in my uh, first lecture where I very, very briefly gave you uh, a sketch of how they approached counting cubic fields. And so in this case, these, these uh, L that you need to count for the numerator to say get this Z mod 3Z moment, right? We have this semi-direct product of Z mod 3Z with Z mod 2Z by minus 1. That's just the group S3. So, they, that, so one just needs to count S3 Galois extensions. But of course, S3 Galois extensions, they're sextic extensions, but they correspond um, to non-Galois cubics. They all have like one isomorphism type of non-Galois cubic in them, and uh, every non-Galois cubic you know, has a Galois closure. Um, and so uh, we already talked about how they could count non-Galois cubics. And so they can count S3 Galois extensions, which is almost what you need for the numerator here, except um, that they also um, were able to do this imposing l conditions, local conditions, on inertia, um, which is what you need to, to get this sort of, you know, maybe I should say inertia conditions. Maybe there's also a condition at infinity um, here, all right? And so that counting, uh, so it turns out that, you know, they were, remember they were counting lattice points in a fundamental domain, and uh, these inertia conditions are, are mod p squared conditions on the coordinates of the lattice points for every p. And so, you know, they just have these um, sort of uh, sub, sub, uh, la well, sub lattices or translates of sub lattices uh, that, that they have to count, and there are some issues. There are some some things that one has to do with the getting that all to work out for infinitely many p and the error bounds. Um, but they do that, and then they were able to prove um, that this average number of surjections is one. All right, and so this uh, <laughs> is indeed as predicted by the Cohen-Lister heuristic. So we, um, uh, yeah, so. As you would hope, uh, especially because this theorem of Davenport and Hybron, I mean, I failed to put years in everywhere, but this predates the cohen lenstra heuristics. Uh, so certainly the fact that this was already known uh, was, in, in one case, uh, was a, was a helpful, helpful piece of evidence. Mm. Um, and, you know, shortly, uh, of course, uh, just by uh, sort of, uh, kind of meta thinking, of course, the Cohen Lister heuristics must have predicted this uh, since they wouldn't have put out conjectures that contradicted like the one theorem, which still remains the, the, the one theorem. All right, but let's see. Um, yeah, so what does that mean that it was predicted by the Cohen Lister heuristics? If you remember um, how I described that previously, I said, oh, well, the, av the empirical average over class groups. Uh, is predicted to be that just this group theoretical average over abelian uh, p groups of where every abelian p group is weighted by one over its number of automorphisms. So when I say that this theorem up here is saying that this average or moment is one, uh, was predicted by the Cohen-Lister heuristics, I mean um, uh, that, that, that the, the average, the group theoretic average is one for every um, 
a BAMP group B. So that's a kind of uh, cool thing also about the uh, cohen linster distribution for uh, imaginary quadratic fields. It's the, you know, it, it, this is the distribution on abelian P groups whose, uh, whose, all of whose moments are one. Um, and one could actually um, work, that, uh, work that out in a number of different ways. Um, in Conan Linster's original paper, they, they develop some great machinery with, with generating series that can help average, you know, average all kinds of functions uh, with this weight. Because, of course, once you make a conjecture like this, you'd like to actually be able to, to, to see what it, it says in various cases. So that's a very powerful machinery um, that you could use, to, for example, to, to, find, to find this, this average. Um, uh, but I, I, since we talked before about this matrix model, I'll just give you maybe a quick way to think about uh, to think about these averages being one. So remember, last time we took a Haar random matrix uh, from uh, n by n matrices over the p adic numbers. So let, let's think about that. Uh, that matrix, and then we took its co-kernel uh, and, and thought about that as a random abelian p group. And so what, what are the um, moments of, of those co-kernels? So if we want the, the bth moment, the expected number of surjections from the co-kernel to b, so what is that co-kernel? It's just zp to the n mod the image of zp to the n under n, or otherwise, this is like, this is the, you know, this is the column space. <laughs> column space of n, all right? Um, and this is actually, you know, last time we very briefly talked about something that was where we were essentially uh, computing the expected number of isomorphisms from this to b, and so actually computing surjections is like, just well, we just stop one step short uh, <laughs> of that that argument. Um, so, so every such surjection would come from a map from Zp to the n to b. So we can sum over those maps and we can say what's the probability that this column space is actually in the kernel. Um, and as we discussed yesterday, when you take a Haar random uh, p-adic matrix n by n p-adic matrix, each column. Uh, is independent from Haar measure on Zp to the n, and so the chances that each column lands in the kernel is one over the size of b, and you have n of those independently, so you get this this sum over the surjections of b to the minus n. And so, how many surjections are there from Zp to the n to b? You can actually write that down explicitly, but especially when n is large, it's practically the order of b to the n of them because, you know, most of the time when n is very large compared to b, as you throw down um, uh, n elements of b, there'll be enough to generate b. So these moments of these co-kernels of the Haar random matrices, as n goes to infinity, they go to 1. Um, so, so the limit of the moments uh, is 1. And now, it, this doesn't automatically give that the moment of the limit distribution is 1. Um, and why would we want that? Because we said last time the limiting distribution is the cohen linstra distribution. Um, because to, to, to get between what we set up here and this statement, you have to move the limit from the outside to the inside of this expected value, uh, which is an infinite sum, and you can't just arbitrarily move limits uh, uh, however, morally, it's perhaps the, the I th think the the most convenient way of thinking about uh, the fact that you get that these moments one because you can really sort of see it in these roughly b to the n maps from z p to the n to b and then each of them has a order of b to the n uh, chance of surviving and actually being a, a map from the co kernel. Um, and indeed, one can use this, and this is uh, done in the notes, with a convergence theorem like dominated convergence theorem. Uh, you, you can interchange the limit and uh, the expected value. Like I said, one doesn't just have that this is a limit, but you can write down this number of surjections very explicitly, uh, and then 
you can use that um, with a convergence theorem to show that indeed uh, the moments of this cohen lenster distribution are one. Any questions? Okay, so, um, all right, so just in summary, if uh, we knew o uh, o over class groups that the average number of surjections and man, I really don't like writing these infinities in here, from the CELO P subgroup of uh, our class groups uh, was one for every B, then we would, uh, uh, we would actually know, this is from this moment, moment determining the distribution theorem that I mentioned before, we would actually know that the proportion with any particular CELO P subgroup of their class group was as predicted. Um, but as I pointed out at the beginning, but not vice versa. Uh, so, so, and because of because of the, the appearance of the limit in the whole whole story, uh, so in that sense, knowing these limiting moments is it's it's strictly stronger than than knowing the limiting distribution. It implies uh, the limiting distribution. All right. So, in the next. Um, uh, lecture, that my final lecture tomorrow, I'm going to talk about the generalization uh, of these conjectures to class groups of higher degree extensions. So, so far it's been all class groups of quadratic extensions, just because that was a good place to start. Um, but we're interested in, of course, class groups of higher degree extensions as well. Now, um, because of the fact uh, that um, uh, the, uh, maybe I should say here, class group, sort of class group elements, elements of class groups of quadratic fields correspond to orbits of binary quadratic forms. So I'll just say, so this is a, this is a correspondence, as far as I understand, that, that's due to Dedekind. So you often hear people talking about Oh, Gauss conjectured this and that and this about class groups of quadratic fields. Gauss was really conjecturing uh, about uh, orbits of, of binary quadratic forms, and now we just translate that into the language of class groups. But because of this, um, because of this relationship, and then us having a good reduction theory over here on the binary quadratic forms, uh, there are very large tables of class groups of quadratic fields, so a lot of data available. Um, and that... Uh, you know, data has played an important role, as I mentioned before, in both sort of uh, inspiring, uh, you know, creating a need for conjectures to sort of explain phenomena that were being observed empirically, and also to provide evidence uh, for those conjectures. And these very large tables uh, show that the cohen lenster conjectures for quadratic fields look really good. I think there's every, every reason to, to believe them. Um, Exactly, exactly as I've stated. And um, so in higher degree, uh, one does not have this same, this, this same correspondence. Um, and so the tables are much smaller uh, at computations of, are much slower and all of the kinds of statements that we've made so far about distributions of class groups of quadratic fields and the statements that we're going to make um, tomorrow about higher degree fields are all just limiting statements. They're statements about limits, but they don't include any, any conjectural information on how quickly that limit is going to be approached or any kind of speed of convergence. We say the limit of x, as x goes to infinity is supposed to say be 1, but we don't say how quickly we plan to get there. Um, and this I introduces uh, significant challenges uh, in using empirical evidence uh, for conjectures of class groups distributions of, um, of higher degree fields. And 
And that is actually really important because unlike this situation where these, uh, these quadratic uh, field conjectures look quite good, there are, there are various uh, anomalies and issues with the higher uh, degree conjectures, some of which we will discuss tomorrow. And so you would really like to, uh, so there's a, a much bigger space for, for good empirical evidence uh, to, to play a role in understanding those conjectures. So why am I talking about this um, today uh, uh, before I, I talk about all these other conjectures? Because I think that there's something important to be done in the quadratic case. And, um, and that, that is, I think that in the case of the Cohen-Linster heuristics for distributions of class groups of quadratic fields, where we're pretty confident that the limits are, are approaching the numbers that we, we think they are, it would, be, it would be excellent to have good heuristics, predictions, conjectures for things like the speed of convergence or error terms or secondary terms um, um, you know, for these Cohen-Linster conjectures here, here I'm talking about for quadratic fields as a start um, because this is a case where we're pretty confident in the, in the actual limits. And that makes it much easier to, to be on solid ground to try to develop uh, a theory or even just predictions from computations from tables of uh, how quickly we're going to get there. And then, you know, especially how uh, d does this sort of speed of convergence or error terms or secondary terms depend on which moment we're computing or maybe which group we're aver you know, averaging how often it happens. Um, and I think that this is especially interesting if it can be done in a way such that it would give insight into what we might imagine for higher degree fields. Um, and so maybe it's a little bit uh, you know, confusing if all the real questions about what is, is going on or not are for higher degree fields, why would you start here um, uh, where, the, where, where we believe very solidly in the conjectures? It's because um, it, it's, it's very hard to uh, make guesses about the speed of convergence when you're not totally clear what limit you're actually even heading towards. Um, so I think that having a good understanding um, of, uh, of, of what we should predict for these sorts of things uh, will be in, you know, starting in the quadratic case, maybe using that to build up to higher degree cases will be very important for future empirical investigation of the conjectures for class groups of higher degree fields. Um, all right, so I want to, yeah, I'll show a picture a little bit about what some of these, um, what some of these things look like. So here is um, a graph. Okay, so there are four um, lines uh, uh, in this graph. And so these are, um, these the, and there are three labeled here. The three labeled are all um, moments. So these are moments of imaginary, so these are of, imaginary quadratic fields. And so remember we said that the moments of the class groups, uh, you know, of class groups of imaginary quadratic fields should all be one, okay? And so this, this purple line is the Z mod 5Z moment, the average number of surjections onto Z mod 5Z. And the blue line uh, is the Z mod 3Z moment, average number of surjections to Z mod 3Z. And the red line is the Z mod 3Z cross Z mod 3Z moment. So it's, uh, and uh, maybe I should explain this um, axis here is saying if you take discriminant up to X and you see it's um, plotted here, the you know, log of X over log of 2. So this is like, you know, up to discriminant of K is less than 2 to the 30. So this is as the discriminant increases, you know, up to, two, you know, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 10, 2 to the 15. 2 to the 30, it looks like this goes up to 2 to the, the 32. So as x uh, is going to infinity, the purple line and the blue line and the red line uh, are all predicted um, to, to hit, hit 1 here. Um, and so 
Um, even from this picture, one can observe many things. Uh, uh, one, they, they all seem to be coming up from below. All right, so it's not an asymptotic uh, being, being sort of approached like this or something. They're all uh, coming in from below, which really suggests some kind of secondary uh, term. Um, and that persists with, 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 you know, this is just a sample, but with other, other uh, moments, this um, uh, hitting one from below uh, persists, so it's suggesting there's some sort of negative uh, secondary term. It's interesting uh, that the here, if you see the purple line, the Z mod 5Z moment is, a, is ahead. It's getting there faster, um, which you might be kind of surprised just because it's a bigger group. You might, it, it feels like it should be harder to have uh, surjections onto Z mod 5Z. So that I really have no um, explanation or understanding of, of why uh, the Z mod 5Z moment is ahead. And then this, of course, this is this Z mod 3Z. Crest zero three z moment is is slower, not even so clear. Uh, <laughs> maybe at this point, um, uh, where it, where it's going to level off. And of course, it, theoretically, this ha this you know red z mod three z crest z mod three z moment has to be behind the blue one because you can't start having subjections to z mod three z cross z mod three z until you have subjections to z mod three <laughs> z. So um, there's some theoretical. Uh, restriction uh, there. Uh, so maybe, yeah, I'll mention. Um, can, I, can I ask? The yes. Did you, uh, maybe, maybe I missed it. Did you say what the yellow and green was? Yes, that's what I'm going to say next. Oh. Yes, yes. Good question. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes. So um, this uh, chart is. is from a paper uh, that was mostly interested in this other line, this yellow and green line, and these were being used as a reference to show the kind of what you would expect convergence uh, uh, to, to, to be like. So exactly in the, um, uh, in the um, sort of uh, 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 way that I was suggesting uh, for the class group distribution conjectures for higher degree fields. However, this is, um, this is a case of a generalization not to higher degree fields, it's still of quadratic fields. Um, but this is, so remember we said that these, um, uh, you know, Z mod 5Z moments is like the average number of unramified Z mod 5Z uh, extensions and these are the unramified Z mod 3Z extensions and so this is about this green and yellow line is about counting unramified um, uh, A4 uh, extensions so that's why this this A4 of course um, it's that isn't about uh, surjections from the class group to, to something it's Surjections from the fundamental group of, of spec OK or the Gallo group of the maximal and ramified extension. Um, so it's not directly a class group thing. That's why you see here in the title of this paper non abelian Cohen Lenstra um, uh, moments. Uh, and so uh, the, the context is that it was just, it's very helpful when trying to, uh, to guess where this uh, is going to land uh, to have. To, to have a sense of the growth of other analogous uh, functions. So just in case you're wondering, we predict that this is going to land at 2. Um, and, uh, and since you believe that this is going to land at 1, uh, then <laughs> maybe you can believe this is going to land at 2. Um, <laughs> the, the other, actually, the other, I'll just note another thing here in this picture. There's the sort of green and the yellow. Um, so uh, the green are, is a computation of actually all fields up to that discriminant, and then the yellow uh, is a computation of sampled fields. So instead of all fields of you know, uh, discriminant, we randomly sample uh, some. And if you are actually able to take a, a, good, um, a good 
good sample. You expect that to be, to be very good. Uh, now, for quadratic fields, you probably aren't ever going to, I mean, it's going to be a while before you need to do that because it's so fast to compute uh, class groups and some, you know. Uh, but here, um, one has to make much more expensive computations. And so this is something that I discuss at several places in the notes um, that especially, uh, especially once these computation, the computations you want to do um, are more expensive per field when they're doing things like computing class groups of higher degree fields. You, it's probably very much quicker and just as useful to have sampled data where you don't do all the fields up uh, to uh, discriminate 2 to the 30, but just have a, a good, good random sample of them. All right, so, um, all right, so we do actually understand, so one thing theoretically um, about this picture, which is actually this, this Z mod 3Z, this blue line, this convergence, um, I said, oh, it really looks like there's a secondary term there um, in actually both cases, but we know, we, we do know one thing, um, so we're, you know, <laughs> the moral of these <laughs> several talks has been we can count cubic fields. <laughs> That's the thing we can do. All right, so um, there is a known secondary term. Uh, so again, it comes from, from counting cubic fields really, really well. So um, uh, from work of uh, Barbara Shanker and Zimmerman and Taniguchi and Thorne, and then actually a more recent paper of Bhargava, Taniguchi and Thorne, um, we, and this is a little bit of abuse of this notation, but say for K, either imaginary or real quadratic fields, this Z mod 3Z moment, and the reason this is abuse of notation is I said this was a limit, but if you forget about the limit, <laughs> this, this average without the limit, they prove is one minus, and I wrote this minus here, so this C is a, is a positive constant, so this is why it's coming up from below, um, X to the minus one sixth, all right? So this is, so I was talking about secondary terms and error terms. So this is precisely what I mean by a secondary term. They give C, um, you know, so C greater than zero is given explicitly. And so that is, that is explaining this, um, you know, this gap here, that it's negative. And you see, by the time you get to here, it's sort of approaching at a very regular rate, all right? And that's the... That's the, the x to the minus one sixth rate. Uh, and then beyond that, um, they have you know, a further, further error term at x to the, at, at x to the minus one third. Um, uh, so, um, yes. Yes. Oh, except, oh, sorry. For real quadratics, um, with, for real quadratics, it's one, the, the value of the moment, it's one third. And the, and the constant, th this next constant is different too, but it's the, uh, I'll, I'll, so this, this, is, this is the real, uh, yeah, the real case. All right, so we'll say that, that is for imaginary quadratics, and this is for real quadratics. So I haven't talked about, you know, we didn't talk about the values of the moments. Those are, those are for the real quadratic case. They're one over the size of the group, and that's, that's worked out in detail um, in the notes. But they have the same, uh, f uh, you know, the same shape secondary term, also negative, just with a different constant um, than the error term. Um, okay, uh, yes, and so uh, just the final thing I want to say, since I'm um, uh, encouraging a more computational investigation uh, into, um, you know, into the con speed of convergence and sort of secondary terms and error terms of these, I want to point out um, uh, one, uh, one paper. Uh, so this is of um, Lewis and Williams, sort of, who did some numerical investigation into secondary terms. Uh, and this was a, uh, um, an undergraduate research project and has, has some nice data. And like, if you want to think about this, I think, you know, you, sh you should start and look and, and see. Um, and I just pulled up one, uh, one chart from their paper to highlight. So this is the, the difference um, that they're seeing between a predicted a value and an actual value. 
And these axes here start at zero. And so the fact that, uh, um, the, fact that the differences are always positive, you see even in the 5, 7, P equals 11, 20, the fact that these differences are always positive and they're not going um, below this line is just more cases of this claim that I, I, I told you seems to always empirically happen, um, that um, these averages seem to be approached from below. Uh, and also, I think it's a very, um, very interesting question to understand sort of heuristically like, um, why, why that is, is so strongly the case. Um, all right, that is it for today. Okay, we have...